We're live. Praise God. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back, Rick. Thank you, sir. Rick missed our last week, so we had to finish up baptism with Adam. Um, tonight, we're going to hit on a subject that's another foundational subject for Christians. And it's one that is often kind of uncomfortable to have people to talk about. And uh, it's one that people often get wrong. And therefore, we thought we would hit on it. I don't know how long it'll take us to go through this. This subject is Christian giving. And uh, we know out here in the church, if you will, there's all sorts of doctrines that are out there. There's people preach tithing, people preach offering, people preach alms. People say that's not for today, that's for the Old Testament, that's under the law, and things like that. Well, what we hope to do here is to essentially uh, cut through all of the nonsense and get down to just what the word itself says, plain and simple, so that people can embrace or not embrace as you choose. Uh, what the Word of God says. God is a gentleman. It's not for me to make anybody do anything. But if you want to be blessed of the Lord, then you'll want to come into conformity with what He has to say. And uh, we're going to go through a couple things here. And some of you might want to, what I did is I went up in, in our articles of faith online. Maybe somebody can put a link to our articles of faith, and it's small enough, somebody could even actually copy and paste, I believe it's the final article of faith, it's called Christian Giving, and uh, it's just one paragraph, and then there's notes for scriptures that support each of those different points, um, but before I go into reading scripture and everything like that, I thought it's actually a very simple statement of God's perspective on Christian giving in our article of faith. So I'm going to just read it. Um, and this is what our article of faith says. <clears throat> we believe that Christians are to tithe, make offerings, and give alms. In other words, you do all three. The tithe is one-tenth of all one's increase. Very simple. If you make, if you have a hundred dollar increase, like you're out here working for somebody and they pay you a hundred dollars for doing that work for them, you have a hundred dollar increase and you would pay a ten dollar tithe. If you give more than ten dollars, the amount above ten dollars might be an offering or it might be given as an alm, depending on what you're doing. If you have no income, if you have no increase whatsoever, then you don't owe a tithe because you've had no increase. Um, but pretty much everybody I know just about, most people have an increase. Sometimes with a spouse, it may be the increase of the working spouse, whoever that may be. Um, and then it's not your tithe to give, it's their tithe to give. So it's pretty simple and straightforward, but it's one-tenth. Now, if you are a merchant and you buy something for $50 and you sell it for $100, you've had an increase of $50. So you would give a tithe of $5 on that. So tithe is one-tenth. There's a lot of different variations that can come up, but that's it pretty simply. Now, what a lot of people don't know, yes, Rick? Um one of the things, Dad, if you go to the seven steps of walking in the prosperity of the Lord, he makes a distinction that tithe is money, not time. Offerings and other things can be different, but he makes the distinction that tithing is always money. Well, it's always money or a good. Yeah. Like if you were a farmer, right. right, and you milked your cows and you got 50 gallons of milk, five gallons would be your tithe. Right. Okay, if you didn't have the money, or if you had 50 year of corn, five year of corn would be your tithe. So you're correct. It's always something that's an increase. It's not time um, and the like. It's uh, 
Uh, but those tie that that time that you give can be a type of offering, or it can actually be a type of alms, depending on what it is. So um, that's where those types of things come in. So the tithe is one tenth of all one's increase. So it's sure it's solely based on increase. If I've got a million dollars in cash under my bed, and I just have that then, and it doesn't increase, it just is the same. I owe no tithe, even though I've got a million dollars because I haven't had an increase. And Phil asked if I do have a million dollars and the short answer is I'm not telling. No, I better say, because somebody might go looking for it, but uh, <laughs> I leave that to you to guess whether you think I have a million dollars. Um, but the, uh, uh, so that's a, that's a tithe. Now you could take that million dollars and give it as an offering or give it as an alms or many other different things, but that would not be a tithe. All right. Now watch, this is something many, 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 many people do not understand. And it is one of the reasons why the church is so off today, because I can tell you because the church does not understand Christian giving, it's why you have for example, all these huge mega churches and everything. Why? You can make a lot of money if you got a, just a few people, if you got a lot of people coming, but everybody's given something. Okay? Now, what's interesting is that under the Levitical priesthood, it was an interesting thing. You had 12 tribes in Israel. One tribe were the ministers. All right. And the portion of the ministers, because they did not receive an inheritance, was they received the tenth. In other words, they partook at the altar and they received a tenth of the increase that people brought. The tithe was the Levites portion. Now, the Levites within the Levitical priesthood above the average Levite was the priesthood. And the Levites had to make a heave offering of their tithe that they got. They made a heave offering of that tithe, which went to Aaron, who received that and partook of that. So Aaron and the priesthood, if you will, received 10% of the increase that came to the Levites generally. Okay? And that's the way in which God provided for his ministers. So it is the Lord's and his ministers are to partake thereof. Tithing is the principal means that God uses to provide for his ministers. And you see back during the days of Nehemiah and some of these scriptures we may go through here, where the Levites portion had not been given to them. And so what did they have to do? They were out there working in the fields rather than being about the Lord's business, because the people who were supposed to honor them as God's priesthood did not. They didn't want to give them their portion. So they had to go out and work to do it. This is the concept the Apostle Paul speaks of, which man goes to war, basically, at his own expense. And he talks about how you don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. Here's the guy who's working and doing the work, he partakes of your increase. This is the way it's been from the beginning, because Abraham paid tithes before there was a law, and Paul's referring to it as a thing to do after Jesus's death and resurrection, and Paul certainly was a guy who did not preach the law. He was a guy who stood against that. So we'll get into these things, but what I want you to see is that that 1 to 11 ratio there that you had under the Levitical priesthood, what that basically means is that if 11, if the 11 tribes gave, each person gave their 10% of their increase, it meant that there was one minister available for every 11 people. And when you have one minister ministering to every 11 people, you have a situation where the minister knows the people and the people know the minister. There isn't anybody who's doing any hiding in that situation, which is exactly how God ordained and established it. He doesn't want the people in the congregation to be able to hide, and he doesn't want the minister to be able to hide. We are to live open lives. 
Okay, if you don't, you don't get lit and then you put the candle under the bushel, right? If you put the candle in the bushel, nobody can be receive the benefit of the light. When Christians don't live open lives, how is anybody to know about Christ? But by contrast, when you walk in the light, all right, then what happens is people will know there is a light and you will be able to give testimony as they ask you about the hope that is in you about what that light is and you tell them about Jesus. That's the concept. So 1 to 11 is the way God had it. And it's interesting with Jesus, how many disciples did he have? He had 12, but one of them was a devil. So in the end, he really only had 11, right? And that's how he lived. He had 11 disciples, if you will. Okay. And when you see this, I did a thing, maybe somebody can find it and put the uh, link. It's a message I preached out in Texas a few years back. Somebody may remember, which was about, you remember this one about the one to 11? Let me just show you the way this works, folks. See, if you want to understand how the church is supposed to grow, it doesn't grow by one minister having a thousand people in his church. The way the ministry grows is that one minister trains 11 people to do as he does, and then they go forth and do it with 11 other people, which means you now have 121 new people, okay? And as you have 121 new people and they come to be trained in how to do it, now you have 121 times 11, which is like 1,121. What's amazing is if people did as Jesus did, and remember he said, it is not for us to be greater than our master, but we can be as our master, right? Isn't that what he talks about? Okay, if we are as our master, then if it took him three years to train his disciples to be able to go forward in the ministry, then it ought to not take more than we ought to be able to train up new ministers. Likewise, in the same way Jesus did by on-the-job training in three years so that they can do as he did. It's exactly what the apostles did, all right? And it's interesting, there was like 120 in that upper room, which is basically 11 times 11 at the day of Pentecost. You see these things at work, and then it went up from there, okay? Now, what I want to get at is if you did this in the short in the short space of 30 years, I have now been a Christian for 30 years, in the short space of 30 years with people who have a willing heart, you could literally have every single person on the entire earth, all seven or eight billion of them in 30 years. Think of that, folks, starting with one who then trains 11, who then each of them train 11, who then each of them train 11, and so on. And within 30 years, every single person on this earth would be under discipleship, and you would not have any relationship that was more than 11 to 1. Imagine that. See, now you begin to understand why the tithe is what God's portion is to the minister, so that they are sustained at more or less, actually slightly above, the manner in which the members of that fellowship are sustained. And in that way, that both honors God, and it makes them mutually dependent on one another. The minister better give good counsel, because if he doesn't give good counsel, the people aren't going to do right, and they're not going to be blessed of God. But when he does give good counsel and the people follow it and the people are blessed of God, then they ought to be willing to share the blessing what they got from God because of the counsel of the minister. It's really not very complicated. Yes, Rob. One of the um, things that is in John 20 that Jesus speaks about is that the 11 or 12 minus Judas that he was given, he kept. And that's um, one of the important benefits of that ratio is being kept. Right, the ability to be kept. So, so tithing is the principal means that God uses to provide for his ministers. And I'm just reading that right out of our article of faith. Next, it says, offerings can be made for many purposes, such as providing for the creation and maintenance of a place of worship, 
for God's ministers and the poor. And we're going to go through and look at many different examples of this. One of the ones that most of you probably are aware of um, relates back to the time of Moses, which is when the children of Israel were in the wilderness and God had them established the tabernacle with the sanctuary tabernacle being a big tent in the sanctuary and all of the different things which required gold precious stones it required wood it required all kinds of things you know fabrics required all sorts of stuff well what happened is all of that was provided by the free will offering of the people nobody was compelled to give anything Nobody was bludgeoned and said, now I want everybody to stand up who's given to our sanctuary. No, it was done. People gave as they chose to give or they didn't give. And what happened is they gave so abundantly that there was more than they needed and they had to be told that's enough. Stop. Yes, Phil. Uh, two things in that, though, you know, they were... Um... They were pretty poor in Egypt, but when they got delivered out, they spoiled the Egyptians. And so that's where all that came from. And you see them with a willing heart turn back and give to the point where they said he had, we had enough. The other point about that, because you talked about time can be an offering too, is you had a couple that was given wisdom to know how to build that tabernacle. But if you read that, I forget what chapter that is, but if you actually read that, you had others of a willing heart that joined into building the tabernacle as well. And as they engaged, now they, they got that wisdom, but as they engaged, they got that wisdom as well to go forward and build the tabernacle as well, which is kind of interesting because they, and they stepped out and engaged, and then they got the wisdom. It wasn't two guys were given it first, but the others, they got it when they engaged and joined into it. When they stepped out in faith. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, Rick, you probably remember your dad's story of H. Richard Hall's um, keyboard player or organ player. And what it was is the guy never played the piano or anything before. H. Richard Hall was walking through a town and he turned and he said, you come with me. You're playing the organ tonight. And he played the organ from that moment forward. He had never been trained at all. And what's interesting is Andre Crouch, who's a famous modern musician, he had a similar thing happen with um, playing the keyboard <clears throat> in his father's church from the age of eight years old. When his father asked him, he said, Andre, he said, you, Andre Crouch was a stammerer and a stutterer. <clears throat> he said, you want to serve the Lord in the music ministry? He looked up at me, yes, daddy. As he said, yes, daddy. And you know what? He learned to talk and to sing and to play the keyboard um, starting the next week. So I don't know his full story, so I don't want to you know, kind of presume to do it, but at a very early age, he, in an extraordinary manner, was able to overcome every obstacle that you would think he'd be the least likely one to be able to do that in the world, in the whole church, to becoming the one who was doing it and went on to be world famous for doing that, which he was doing. This is the concept of God's strength being made perfect in weakness and how we don't have to look at our own shortcomings as any limitation to him. So, um, offerings there, yes. Steve, I've lost audio here. Um, offerings here also can go to God's ministers. For example, I go to a church, say I, say I go to the fisherman ministry here in 
Cottageville, South Carolina. So I pay my tithe to my local minister here in Cottageville, South Carolina. But if I'm traveling to Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm going to church there, am I not receiving? I'm receiving. So I would put something in that plate for that church and its minister, because look, I, as your father used to say, uh, Ricky, you know, if you're taken down here in the, uh, uh, like in this area, well, I'll, I'll use New England for a moment, Vermont, you don't go, you don't say, well, look, I, I always buy my groceries at Shaw's. And so then when you go into Price Chopper, you just walk out with the groceries without giving anything. No, you pay at Price Chopper when you go to Price Chopper. You follow what I'm saying? And that's the way in which it's supposed to be. And that's a way of offering to a minister. You'll see it sometimes churches taking up love offerings for an evangelist that comes through. That's a type of offering. It's not actually a tithe. He's not there dealing with their issues every single week like the pastor. He's passing through, but he was a blessing, and we want to bless him for being a blessing. That's a good example of how that works. Uh, yeah, and support the work. You ought to pick that up if they want them to hear you. To support the work they're doing out there. That's right, the support he's doing. The preaching the gospel and reaching, reaching the lost. That's an important cause, I would say. Absolutely. So then you go, um, you have also then the, you can also give, you give offerings for the benefit of the poor, those that are less fortunate among you. You can also give it, for example, you know, here we are broadcasting on Facebook. We've got a Mevo camera over here. We've got microphones. We've got a soundboard. We've got a computer you know, many of these items that we have and use have been given to us by others who had and gave us these things, or others have given money specifically for these. So this is the way offerings work. And then you go, um, and it's, I want you to understand it is in offerings that one's liberality or lack thereof shall be measured back to him by God. I'm reading that out of our article of faith. And what that's referring to is that, see, the tithe, when you give 10%, that opens the windows of heaven. That's what pours you out the blessing is your offering on in addition to and over and above your tithe. Now, your offering does not have to be money. It can be like if somebody had a, a, a computer that would work and they gave it to us that could be an offering. If somebody came over and set everything up for us, because we don't know how to do it, and taught us how to do it, that would be an offering, even though it's just, it's time, okay? Those are the kinds of things you can do. And then you come down to um, alms, which are the final element. Alms are to be done in secret, not before men. So in other words, what that means is that when you give to somebody less fortunate than yourself, you should report it to the IRS to make sure that they know you uh, uh, have given and the like, or you should go and let everybody in your community know or let them know how great you are for having helped this person over here. <clears throat> None of that is true. No, rather, when you give an alm, nobody should know about it. That's not between you and anyone else. It's between you and God. All right, that's what that's about. And we're going to go through some things on alms. And alms are there to benefit the poor and store you up treasure in heaven. Anybody remember that thing that Paul spoke about and also Jesus, where it says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also? And people think, like when they think of the rich young ruler or some of these others, they think, well, that's great. What can I do? I can't draw down on any of that today. Tell that to Cornelius. Cornelius's alms came before God, and he was the first Gentile to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'd say that that treasure he had in heaven was poured out unto him here and for his benefit when he was here on earth. I would say, I think it was Lydia, who was the one who was a worker in purple, who her alms deeds, remember we were talking about how it can be the things you do can be an alms? 
her alms deeds. They were telling Peter about her alms deeds. And you know what? Peter went over, kneeled beside her, prayed, and she was raised from the dead. I'd say she got a blessing um, for the fact that she had given alms on this earth. Do you follow? So I want you to understand, it's just, it's a heavenly blessing. Tabitha or Dorcas, thank you, Rob. That's, that is who it was. I, uh, Lydia was another woman who was another thing. So this is Christian giving. So we're going to, why don't we turn over to Acts? I want to look at Acts for a moment. And Rick, um, I'm probably going to have you read over here. I'm not sure if I'm going to start it in Acts 2 or in Acts 4. I encourage those of you who are out there, um, what I encourage you to do is go look at our one paragraph article of faith that I basically read with amplification to you and read the various scriptures that are there. Just go read the passages for yourself. We may go through many or even all of these passages during the course of this Bible study, but go read them. I've given you kind of the quick, broad brushstroke introduction to Christian giving um, and the like, and some of it may be things you've heard, some of it may be things you haven't heard, some of it may be things you um, are offended at, some of it may be things that are uh, things you're thankful for. Four. They confirm things that you've always believed, but just nobody's ever quite said them. Or for some of you, it may be old hat, in which case, praise God. I mean, it's never bad. I can tell you myself going through this, and I do a lot of teaching of the word, a lot of reading of the word, a lot of study of the word. I, I wrote this. I mean, I actually wrote this and all the scripture references back ooh, more than 20 years ago. I, I wrote this. And I wrote it when I was sitting outside on a chair, much like the one I'm sitting on here, um, down in West Palm Beach, Florida, with a bunch of homeless guys around us and stuff like that, and some land where Davey had a camper, and uh, just sitting outside, I wrote this there while he was, we were doing other things. I wrote the whole Articles of Faith down there, so you know, I, I wrote this and I was reading, I was like, gosh, I didn't remember that. That was good. I mean, there's one thing in there. I was like, I, I didn't ever remember that was even in there. And I'm the one who wrote the daggone thing. So praise God. Don't, I can tell you, I don't care how old hat you think something is. The word of God is a living word and the Lord will bless you in going through it. And he'll establish things to you. That'll be a blessing. Um, so let's see. Ah, Let's begin with Acts chapter 2, Rick. And I'm going to have you begin uh, with verse 36 of Acts chapter 2. Okay. Uh, chapter 2, verse 36. That uh, starts, therefore, let all the house of Israel know. That one? Yeah, read there. Okay. From 36. There Therefore, let all the house of Israel know. You got unmuted. Did. What did you do? We lost you. I, I'm here. I have audio. It looks like a fish out of water, Guppian. Yep, that's all right, Rick. You can just smile at us now. You don't have to grimace. We can read. <laughs> Rob, why don't you read from Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ. All right, just so you guys know the time and place of this, this is Peter speaking after, on the day of Pentecost, after the, he and the other 120 have been filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues um, and the like. He then ministered to the people who were around who didn't know what was going on. And so he's concluding his ministry to them uh, kind of with the knockout punch, which you know, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, which ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So he's in Jerusalem, he's speaking to the people, and he's speaking to the people who were responsible for Christ's crucifixion. You can imagine this was probably the biggest 
kick punch to the gut anybody ever experienced in all of human history is what he had just delivered. So keep going. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So they're pretty desperate now. Keep going. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So he's saying unto them, repent. You know what repent means? What's repent? We did a whole Bible study on repentance, Rob. What's it mean? It means to turn from your sin and walk a different way. Yeah, it means to turn from the way you were going, if yeah. you will. I mean, it, it does happen to be from sin, sin, but it's turning from the way you were going and going an entirely different way. Everything is new. Okay, and I want that I want you to understand that point because it's going to become critical to what we're talking about here in Christian giving in a moment. So uh, keep, keep and, and he's promising them not only forgiveness, that's the remission of sins, he's promising that they're going to be baptized, but they're going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So in other words, they're getting all three baptisms at once. We just did a study on the three baptisms. They're getting all three. They were guilt, they, they hear of their guilt before God of crucifying the Messiah that was sent to them. And the response is if they'll repent, in other words, turn from that way, that he will not only save them and baptize them, you know, take away their sins, but he's going to fill them with the Holy Ghost as well. The full promise of the fathers, just like it went to the 120, is now going to them. Keep going. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and, in, and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. Aha! Uh -huh. I wanted to get right there. We're going to come back to that in a moment. So what I want you to see here back in verse 39 for a moment is it's an amazing thing, and this is the grace of God, but the promise that Peter had just told them they had observed he and a bunch of other guys getting was not just for them who had been with Jesus and who were hoping in this promise. It was now for those who had crucified Jesus, whom they had been afraid of. But I want you to see a thing. Look at verse 40, where he says, and with many other words, did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. In other words, much like we have today in the Christian church, there was a very zealous Jewish religion at the day. Okay, very zealous Jewish religion at the day with great expectation of the Messiah coming to deliver them from the hated Romans, okay? Much like there's a great excitement in Christianity about Christ's return and his justification of the church, okay? And just as they missed it, so is the church generally today completely missing this point. And so you can see, save yourselves from this untoward generation. In other words, if they were now going to walk, truly repent and go forward in that new way, they were going to have to depart from that religion that was responsible for crucifying Christ. Now, don't hear me wrong. I'm not talking about they were departing from the, re the religion of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's not what I'm talking about. That continues to this day. That's Amen. the faith whereby I am saved and you are saved. Okay. But what it was is it was the 
misplaced faith and zeal in a religion that was not of God, but of man. They had made the word of God of no effect with their customs, their practices. Okay, they had made it a null and void all the while talking about how they were keeping it. So these people came out from that and into the place where now who are they listening to? Peter. Peter and the other apostles, yes. and they continued steadfastly. In other words, they did not waver from that commitment. They, what they said, they did. Okay, what Peter and those guys said, these people did. And what happened is, because of that, you saw a mighty, powerful manifestation of God with signs and wonders and other things. Okay, because they continued in that which the apostles had said. In this fellowship, you have many people who have experienced, much like the Jews of Jesus' day, experienced with signs and wonders being imparted unto them, them being the beneficiary of, whether it be multiplying of food, raising from the dead, healing of the sick, casting out of devils, deliverance from all sorts of manner of things, miracles of different things. Many people have experienced that, but have not continued steadfast. Now, what happens, see, as you go to the next thing, is that, and all that believed were together and had all things common. And go ahead and read to the, um, read down for a couple more verses, Rob. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, and they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily as such as should, such as should, such be, as saved. should be saved. Yeah. Right. So what happened is, as they did this, they were willing to take that which they had and sell and goods, things that they have, and part them unto all men as every man had need. In other words, they were willing to take of that which was theirs and see it used for the benefit of others. Why? Why would anybody ever want to do this? This is not something where Peter came back and told him, now you go sell this, and you got to sell that, and you got to give this to the other person. Go for it, Rick. Hopefully you guys can hear me now. I can. Good. The things of this world weren't important to them anymore. The things of God were important to them. And so the, their, that, that treasure, where, you're, where your treasure is there, where your heart be also, their, their heart was in heaven. Their treasure was in heaven. The things of this earth were just a means to an end. They weren't anything that they're going to take with them anyway. So why is it something you want to hold on to? What good to do you? And you can see what you're saying, which is exactly right over in 46, where it talks about, and they did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Remember, if your heart be single, your whole body shall be filled with light. You know, basically, they did of their own voluntary free will without anybody telling them what God, what Jesus had said unto the rich, excuse me, the rich young ruler about if he would be, if he were, if he would be perfect, go and sell all that which you have, give unto the poor. He didn't say give it to me. He said, give unto the poor and follow me, and ye shall have riches in heaven. All right. And he could not do that because he had great possessions. The things of this world had a great hold on him. These folks, really, if you want to think of it, it would be like a people when you heard Peter preach, who they all of a sudden realized they were guilty of the most heinous crime that had ever been committed on earth, and that they were totally deserving of immediate instantaneous death. And instead of death, they not only were forgiven, but they were welcomed as family to the one whom they had done it to. 
Okay, what could compare to that for them? Now, the sad truth is the same is true of each of us. There's not a one of us who this is not true of the, to the differences in your own mind. You don't see it as being true. You know, Steve, they're not the only times that, that, that this type of situation happened. Wasn't it Zacchaeus, the uh, tax, tax the collector, tax collector yep. that had the same revelation in his heart and, and repented and then went forward and, and did a very, very similar thing. The things that had previously been so important to him now were not important because he had access to the kingdom of God. Yes, Megan. Let her grab the mic here, Phil. Well, you show that they, this shows rather that they chose to love the Lord and to love their neighbor because you know, and it showed their love of the Lord first by their love of their neighbors, where it says in 45, they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. So they were looking on the affairs of others. And as there was need and lack with others, they were motivated out of their abundance to supply for someone else's lack. So it actually testifies to the genuineness of their faith in the Lord first. Amen. That is true. Now turn to Acts chapter four, Rick, I'm going to have you begin from verse 32. Because this is Acts four is right after Peter and John went up to the temple and uh, healed the guy at the gate called beautiful and then they were thrown into prison and then they were let out and stuff like that. So, um, Go ahead and read from verse 32. Sure. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Now, the reason why I wanted you to hit that verse, and we'll read some further here, but that evidence is what was their mindset Okay, they didn't see these things. They were bought with a price, right? Remember the parables of Matthew 13, where it talks about there's the two. There's the, uh, there's the guy who um, goes and finds the, uh, uh, what is it that he found buried? He found a treasure buried in a field, right? Isn't that what it is? It's in Matthew 13. And what he does is he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Okay. And you have then the merchant man who finds the pearl of great price, and he sells all that he has to buy the pearl. Okay. In the merchant, in the field and the treasure, what it is, is God in that one is the one who bought the field, which is the world. Okay. And he bought it for the treasure that was in there, which was the elect seed of God and those who would receive him, just like we read these did here, um, for, at their word, okay? So he was willing to sell all that he had to save them. And the price was the blood of his son. Um, not just the blood, the death of his son. All right. Then the merchant man who finds the pearl of great price, that's us. We find the pearl of great price, Jesus. Okay. And we sell all that we have that we may gain it. All right. And what happened is in that perspective, now you no longer see that which you have as being your own. You see it as Christ's, your Lord. And therefore, all that you have in whatever manner he would have you make use of it, you are pleased to make use of it in the furtherance of his work, whether it be to pay a tithe, whether it be to pay an offering, whether it be to give an alms. 
You follow what I'm saying? And that's what you had. This was entirely of the people's free will. That was the difference between Barnabas and his blessing at the end of this chapter and Ananias and Sapphira and their death. They didn't have to sell the land. They didn't have to give all that they had gotten. They didn't have to do either of those things. But what they did is they sold it and they kept back apart, but told everybody because they wanted to be seen before men. Remember those who do their alms before men? Right? You're to do your alms in secret. They wanted to be seen before men as being people who had done this and be looked up upon like Barnabas was before them. Yes, Rob. I wanted to say that in Matthew 13, the scriptures you're talking about are verses 44 and 45 and 46. Yes. I, the, I got them right. Praise God. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to mention is it also goes in with the story of the Good Samaritan who, um, well, you could call Jesus the Good Samaritan for sure, but then, and without a doubt, but the Good Samaritan in the sense of us, he went and he paid whatever it cost for the sake of another. Um, and he even said, when I come back, I'll make up if there's any lacking. Yeah, amen. So uh, back to Acts 4. You read verse, you read verse 32. So they, yeah, were of, 32. they were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Okay, this is a heart that is forgiven and free and thankful. And, and right. it's, not, it's not a singular event. This is another event of the same thing happening. Exactly. So this is not like, oh, it happened once. It doesn't apply. This is, this is what happens with repentance. And when a heart understands the, the generosity that's been shown to them by God Almighty. Then why wouldn't they want to do it for their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? And for the sake of those that would want to hear that they would want to have hear the gospel. So go ahead and read 34, read 33 to 35. Okay. And with great power gave, uh, gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and with, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked for as many as, were possessors of lands or houses, sold them, and brought the, the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. All right. So what you see is, as you had a body of people who were of one mind, one soul, you saw the power of God manifest mightily, Right. And you saw that nobody lacked for anything within the fellowship. People were taken care of. That's where you, that's what you were seeing. And you saw the Lord adding to the church daily. Today, I mean, really, this is not the way people look at things. And I, I share this with you right out of Acts, because people want to make this distinction between the Old Testament and the New, and they want to say tithing, offering, and alms is not... This is actually a much higher standard. This is two or more witnesses shall anything be established to a much higher standard. Much, much higher standard. This was Paul's standard that he walked in. It's what he walked in individually. All right. And I share this with you. Because it's not something that God is going to compel anyone to do against their will. Nobody in this fellowship, I hope to God not, if there is somebody, let me know who they are, would uh, compel you or anyone else to do this. You can do it or not do it. It's entirely up to you. All right? But it is in this place that the fullness of the blessings of God rain down freely. You know, it says if you 
sow sparingly, you shall reap sparingly. If you sow liberally, you shall reap abundantly. Okay, that's the law of sowing and reaping that the scripture lays out in multiple places, uh, including in the New Testament, multiple places. So uh, I just wanted to highlight that. Yes, Rob. This is a um, an example of <clears throat> when Christ said that you will, they will know you are Christians by your love one for another too. Absolutely. And that's what she's referring to there. And I think that's actually a verse worth going to, and maybe we'll end there for tonight, um, because we talk a lot in this ministry a lot of times about the law of love, which is basically, I mean, what did Jesus say? All the law and the prophets comes down to two commandments. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love thy neighbor as thyself, okay? Upon this is all the law and the prophets. He then went on, Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto thee, that ye love one another as I have loved you. When Jesus had a couple fishes and some bread, and there were thousands of people out there with him to eat, what did Jesus say? Hey, tough guys, you're going to have to go home fasting. I uh, hope you make it. You little ones, I know you're looking kind of tired, and it's been nice that you came out here. I think you guys are special, but now you got to leave and go home and eat. That's what his disciples wanted him to say, right? But what did he say? He told he, his disciples to feed him. Yeah, he told him, you feed him. You feed him. <laughs> yes, Rob. Well, I was going to say, what we say is, go home and be blessed. <laughs> What's the question we have on Facebook? Oh, it's coming. We got a question coming. All right. So what I wanted to get at here is that that's the commandment of God, that basically everything comes down to love. What you are seeing here is God's love being manifest without a law. Do you follow? You're seeing God's love being manifest without a law. That's what you're seeing happening right there. <clears throat> you're seeing his love. What standard do you go after? Do you go after Christ and his standard? Or do you go after the least you got to do? You're going to say something there, Phil? Yeah, you remember William Penn? I do. You know, when he went and found uh, Philadelphia? Yep. You know, it was the city of brotherly love at that time. And did you know, during that time, it was interesting, and it's not scriptural. I know this is like a perfect example. But, however, you know, William Penn, for sake, forsake everything to come and he took all his basically his inheritance to come over here and bring the city of philadelphia here i mean he really did it was a pretty amazing story about him um and he had a great opportunity in england to be very successful but he forsook all that and he came and he started the city and what ended up happening was that there was like in the city of philadelphia was really like a safe haven for all to come you know from different you know, backgrounds, different, Germany and different, different places, different places, not only that different, maybe because sometimes you would have like the Quakers and then you'd have this different group and they kind of be like bitey at each other. They would not agree on some things, but Philadelphia was a safe place where they would come to. But, you know, the least amount of law was written in Philadelphia at that time. And it was seriously one of the most peaceful places you can go. It was actually a safe place that people could go that was settling over here in America at the time. I just wanted to highlight that. It's kind of interesting. And you didn't have all this law, but your question just came through. Absolutely. Very good point. Yes. But where oh, read it. Yep. So when you do give back, you do it with good intentions and without expecting anything in return. And that's how the blessings come back to you from God. Yeah, you look to when you do things, you don't look at the person you're giving it to to get it. One of the one of the hardest things. Let me just share this with you, because this is a very you bring up a good point. Uh, the person. What's it? Yeah, it was Caesar. Oh, hi, Caesar. And also, I want to attach at the end. First Corinthians 13 on that. But yeah, let me say this, uh, Caesar, this a very common problem for Christians is this. You give and you help and you do these things. And you know what? People are unappreciative. And so what it makes you want to do is not give. And 
what happens, the reason why that happens is because you're looking at the person rather than at the Lord. And see, what you saw in the things we were reading over there in Acts 2 is you saw a people who gave cheerfully. They were glad to do these things. They rejoiced in God. These were not begrudging givings. And elsewhere in the New Testament, you'll see Paul talks about being a cheerful giver. There are many people who do not give cheerfully. They give out of obligation. I can tell you, if you give out of obligation, your reward is your attitude of obligation. Don't even bring it. If you're going to give, give because you want to, not because you have to. All right? I just want you to understand right up front, that's the thing. Go ahead, Rob. I think it's in the scriptures here, but where the, um, Jesus looked at the people giving lots at the temple and then the woman that had nothing. See, yeah, that the woman, widow's might. The widow's might. That woman valued the things of God. Right. Yeah. She gave of her penury, it yeah. says, which All means she, she gave of her necessity, everybody else of their abundance. So think of it this way. The person who has a dollar for a bus fare home gives their last dollar and therefore does not have their bus fare home, but they give it gladly. And there's other people who have their own car and have $100 in their pocket and have everything they need and stuff like that. And to put $10 in feels like a feels like wrong and too much. Okay. And what he was getting at is that little widow who put her dollar in, or really in that instance, the mite is more like a penny. And she put her penny in, and he said she had given more than them all. And it's funny, I mean, people who know me, and I receive tithes and pray over them, put them in the bank account and stuff like that. I can tell you, I pray over one cent tithes. We account for in our ministry for one cent ties, two cent ties, five cent ties. I don't mean that we write down five cent ties. We just write it down as a offering or whatever, you know, tithe and offering from people. But they get deposited with the $435 tithe check. They get deposited with everything else because in the Lord's sight, it's not about the amount it's about the faithfulness and the expression of gratitude and love that it represents. Yes, Rick. You know, as, you, as you're talking about that, Steve, I, I bet you if we went around and asked people who would they rather be, the rich man or Lazarus? And, you know, I don't know what people would say, but I don't know that many people would identify with the rich man. What you're, what you're really saying is that most Christians are the rich men. Yes, it's a it's a very common situation that people don't realize. They always, you can always find somebody who's got more than you. Short answer. So you can always look at somebody else as being the rich man. Um, but the truth of the matter is, I can tell you in our political system, you to a certain extent have two parties, both of which appeal to the love of money. One in the sense of taking money from people who have it and give it to those who have not. And the other from the standpoint of saying to those that have, we're going to let you keep it and not give it to the ones that have not. They're just appealing to different sides of the same coin, each thinking themselves more righteous than the other. And they're both wrong. Okay. It's the tragedy of things. They're both wrong. So um, we'll finish up with this and then we'll quit for the night. In John 17, which Robin brought up, you have in John 17, this is, if you look at verse one, it says, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. And then it goes down, and I'm going to skip down to uh, verse 16. Um, I, I go from verse 15, 14, okay? 
where he's talking of the 11 and he goes, I have given them, that is the 11, thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. In other words, he's giving them the same commission with the exception of dying on a cross because their death on a cross would have no further effect. So it did not need to happen. Um, and he goes, uh, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent also, I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Now watch this. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Does that not sound like what we are just reading over in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4? They were believing on Jesus through the word of Peter and the other apostles. And they were continuing steadfast in the doctrine of Peter and the other apostles. Remember, Jesus' words had not been written down. None of the Gospels had been written down. That didn't happen until many, many years later were those things written down. And they weren't written down out of remembrance. They were written down by revelation. Okay, completely different scenario. Um, now let's keep going. And says, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. In other words, if you, if a believer is not one with God the Father and one with the Lord Jesus Christ, then how is the world to know that Jesus is indeed the Savior? The whole way you know it is because you are one with him. When you are one with him, can they distinguish between you and him? No. Now, I'm not talking about your flesh, but your works, if you will, because the works that are going on and through you are not your own but rather the very works of God that no man can do. All right. Yes, Rick. Yeah. Jesus says the works that I, if he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he'll do also. He ain't far greater works. I mean, these, this is the, the, the entrance that the Lord has made available to those that will believe what you're talking about. Amen. So I'm just going to read a little further. And it says, in the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. You see a second witness to the fact of oneness being central to the gospel going forth. That's why he was able to add to the church daily, such as should be saved. It's just the fact of the matter, folks. And I know what this is like. People may not know it. People may not even know that I do know what this is like because they didn't notice it even when it was happening. But I actually do know what this is like. I have personal experience with this, not out of any commandment but simply by the move of the Spirit of God on a thankful heart okay, who chose to cleave to the one who was one with God. All right, so some of you are long enough ago and were there should actually know exactly what I'm talking about, um, and you can reflect on that. But it is a truth what this is saying here. And this is really at the heart of Christian giving is love, first of God and then of others. And your giving is going to reflect your love of God and then others. 
It's just the truth of the matter. So we'll probably pick up and go through more of this on the ties, offerings, and alms, and breaking down some different examples and everything. But hopefully this gives everybody a overview and hopefully a rather clear view of what Christian giving is actually all about. And so it is purely an act of your will without compulsion from me or anybody else. So pray about it and see where you stand before the Lord and how your giving reflects your love or lack thereof. And Caesar, and final answer to your question, let me just say this, that when you look to God for the blessing, he will never fail. When you look to anybody else for the blessing, man will almost certainly fail. And with respect to all common, all things common, I can tell you a common mistake on that that people don't get is people will want what they see other people have in the fellowship. So they'll give with the idea that they're going to get from the others. That's not how it works. Okay, it's not for me to compel anybody to take what they have and give it unto anybody else. Not, it's not my role. All right. God won't compel people to do that. He might encourage, he might exhort, he may open your eyes to see what a blessing it would be. But when he's doing that, he's not talking about what a blessing it'll be to you. He's talking about what a blessing it'll be to them. I just want you to understand that's how it works. It's not about what a blessing it'll be to you. Your blessing you trust him for. You don't do it in a, oh, if I give you this, I'll get that. Look, ministries are famous for all this kind of lying, cheating, conniving, stealing to get money away from people and shake them down for money. That is not, we don't, if you come into one of our services, we don't even do an offering plate. We haven't done an offering plate in probably 20 years, 15 years. Anywhere that I know of. When we, we do a even, tent revival, what's that? We don't, even put, we don't even put baskets out anymore, Steve. <laughs> well, actually, I I had a basket. Out. I just forgot to tell anybody it was on top <laughs> of the thing. So I don't know. I don't. I never checked it. I don't know if I don't know that anybody That's ever put it. Funny. There. But I, I just share it with you. Look, it's more blessed to give than to receive. All right. And so when you're of that mind, you're not looking at what you're going to get from somebody else but rather you're looking for what you can give and impart unto another. That's at the heart of all Christian giving. That's it. So pray about that, folks. I want everybody to be blessed. These are, when we go through these things, they're going to be about laws of blessings and cursings. God wants you to be blessed. He does not want you to be cursed. So may the Lord bless you, and we'll catch up again next week with a continuation, most likely, unless not, uh, in which case, who knows what it'll be. So may the Lord bless you, folks.